Hello ladies, I'm Mrs. Sherman and I have a homemaking blog which I'd like you to go to and I will leave a link so that you can leave a comment over there and also see some of my other posts. We found that since YouTube has changed some of their rules, it's difficult to make these videos play for some people. If you, I, I find it hard to believe that the people who created these new rules are actually English speaking people because they have this strange saying this is not for children or this is for children well that's ridiculous because if you click this is for children then they think it means that it has children's things in it and should go in a children's category and over there with the children's animated cartoons and things like that and then if you click it is not for children then it's almost um, rated dangerous and you don't your subscribers don't get notified so we always say if something is child safe or not child safe, even if it is not for children, such as your home, you know, the whole house is not for children. Not everything in it is child, uh, child is designed for a child to use, but it is generally child safe. And so I'd like you to go over to my blog because we've discovered that if I embed these videos on my blog, they play. So you can go over there and you can see what we're doing over there and please leave a comment. Also, my PayPal is over there and I don't allow any uh, comments here on the channel and I don't have any kind of donation button over here because I am just making these for my blog and I, this is just a holding place for now. And um, although it gives me fits and sometimes I just uh, want to uh, just abandon the whole idea. I'm sticking with it and I'm going to beat it. <laughs> so today I uh, would like to welcome all of you who are new and tell you that this is support for homemakers and it's a listen as you go video. So you're not supposed to sit here and watch me unless you're sick in bed, but there isn't anything going on here, right here. This is Christmas Eve, and I know over in Australia you're having the end of Christmas Day. It's kind of exciting. We get to share each other's Christmases uh, before and after. And I love this virtual era that we're living in because we can do so much more, you know. It's harder on some ways to get people to come to your house and have a class, but and yet it's easier to do a class because you only need to prepare your notes in one part of the house that people see and uh, you don't have to inconvenience anyone and no one has to leave their children in order to come to a homemaking class. And But I do want you to stay long enough to see my teacup today and I'm wearing one of those time and true glittery sweater, sequin sweaters that I got a couple of years ago at Walmart. Towards the end of the year they always have this tremendous discount on everything and you could get some of these that were usually $12. You can get them for $3 so I got the uh, red one which I wore yesterday in the video and this one and, and the white one and I keep them in my drawer and look at them sometimes during the year and think you know I should really get rid of those but then when uh, Christmas comes around it's kind of fun to put them on be all glitzy now today my teacup does not go with <laughs> my black sweater but uh, it's so pretty and I got it at the Goodwill and I would say, I don't know why I think this is probably 1970s or 1980s. It, it uh, really is very new, probably never been used. And one thing that I've noticed about some of the newer ones, they don't put the glaze completely around here or around here, this little circle thing here, and it picks up a lot of black and soil and you have to really clean those but that is not the glaze hasn't covered the ceramic it hasn't covered the uh, the clay so but it's by Crown Dorset I haven't looked that up but it says it's from Stafford made in Staffordshire England it's awfully pretty isn't it and I love this handle you put um, you can put your finger in this side and another finger in here and I love that double handle that's really nice that's a nice easy way to hold something and I'll sit, put a picture of this on my blog it kind of goes okay with black doesn't it I don't wear black very much and this is the only black thing I think I wear so today I and of course I want to divide this in two sections 
And the first section is usually on your appearance. If you're not dressed yet and the day is beginning to start, then I would suggest you uh, make a list and include getting dressed and uh, put little boxes beside your list and then go get dressed and check that off. It's just a feeling of accomplishment to at least get dressed. I heard a lady say the other day that she was amazed at how much time it took just to get herself ready in the morning. And so that is a big deal. You know, it's easier to get out of bed and just start moving around and, and putting things away and doing the things you need to do throughout the day. But it's a lot better to get dressed because the, the prep, you feel more prepared and in gear. So with preparation, I have a few notes here, and, and I usually don't think that these notes will keep me busy for an hour because they're just words that are supposed to trigger a whole lot of other memories or things that I need to talk about. And sometimes I surprise myself and I can go longer than an hour. But the reason I chose an hour is because I realize you can get a room cleaned up, you can get uh, the laundry put in, you can unload the dishwasher, you might be able to clean up one cabinet, you might be able to sort them, some books or papers, you might be able to sweep there are so many things you can do. You can fold, you can put things away, you can bake while you're listening. And I hope to remind some of you that are older now that in the olden days, we used to listen to the radio at home. And it, the things on it weren't all that good. We were just happy to have the background music. And sometimes someone would come on and read something interesting. They would have... Uh, maybe a, a cake uh, box company like Pillsbury would would sponsor some kind of little five-minute program for homemakers to listen to and they always liked to come on and hear that actually I'm thinking I should change this to housework radio instead of housewife radio because I realize there's a lot of people there are a lot of people out there that uh, do housework that aren't in their own home or are not uh, not married and not anybody's wife and so I might change it to Housework Radio. I don't know. I don't have a copyright on the name. And I would welcome other people doing Housewife Radio. Just put your name on it. You know, it would be your version. It would be your type of Housewife Radio or Housework Radio. And um, mine is uh, from the Home Living blog and Mrs. Sherman. And so I have been a homemaker almost almost all my life really because I grew up in a large family and learned to do housework at an early age. So the first thing you want to do is to stay away from any kind of thought of inferiority in the morning when you get up and you're going to get ready. You've got to have a very positive outlook so that you can get dressed with excite and feel excited about what you're going to do. Sometimes I like to think that maybe I am getting ready to go on a, a trip or to go to someone's house or to go somewhere interesting. And uh, when I get ready for that, with that attitude, I have a whole new perspective of my day. Even though I'm going to stay home, I treat it as though I am somewhere else. I talked to you last time about how you're both the uh, maid and the lady of the house it, you have two different roles to play so you're making it nice for yourself and you know making it nice the maid taking care of things picking up things and uh, for yourself the lady of the house so that you can relax so that you can enjoy the fruits of your labor and you know um, I believe it's Ecclesiastes that says that uh, it's good for uh, it's good to enjoy the fruits of your labor and so the fruits of your labor will be something like a nice house, a nice meal, and a happy family. And those are the fruits of your labor. It's very important, therefore, that you not let any negative uh, remark uh, destroy your confidence. It's very important to have confidence because this is an isolated job. It cannot be done any other way it's you, you couldn't get anything done if you did this in a group and it's not like when you go to work outside the home and you're always in some kind of a group and you punch in your time card and you get uh, rewards and you get a paycheck this is totally self-motivating and you are self-employed 
and you determine your own rewards. And I have, when I make a list in the daytime, on one, I fold a piece of paper in half on one side, I write what I need to do, what I must do, what the most important thing is, the most urgent thing. And on the other side, I write what I'd like to do. And so when I get the what I need to do is done, I go to what I'd like to do. And th those are my rewards. And so, first of all, preparation, getting yourself ready, getting your hair fixed as though you were going somewhere very important. I think that is so good, even if you don't see anybody all day, even if you don't hear another voice. It's so important for your dignity, for your self-dignity, for the fact that you are not like the other creatures of the world. You're not an animal. You are a human being with a soul, and that is going to show in how you look after yourself, just that feeling of self-worth and dignity, which is manifested by the way you look after yourself. And I believe you should get your hair, your face, and your clothing, everything done so that it looks like you are dressed for something extremely important. Now, I'm not saying you wear a prom dress, and I know people like to make fun of this when I say get dressed up, but I believe that you need to dress a little better than, um, than someone who is just going to laze around all day because you can give your mind that message. And I always put on a little pair of ankle boots because I want to feel like I'm going to work and also my feet will be protected. Home is a place where you can have a lot of mishaps and accidents and your feet are hard to heal. If you get a foot injury, it may take six months to feel better. So protect your feet. And I wear a pair of boots that... Um, that I know that if something drops, I might feel it, but it's not going to injure me completely. And, of course, we try to be careful, don't we? It's not like we're going around just knocking everything over or dropping them. But you need to really be careful and wear something on your feet that's very protective. I don't like Nikes, heavy tennis shoes, sports shoes. I don't think they're very flattering to ladies, and they don't go with their dresses. And, of course... We've been sold on the idea that these shoes are very therapeutic, but they're not necess it's not necessarily any more therapeutic than a pair of good boots. So now I want to move on to the, um, the, 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 the appearance. I want to move on to the appearance just a little bit higher um, and more, more in detail, and that is how about the idea that you're dressing to work for a king and what I'm talking about is you know the Lord Christ that your job and your calling at home is design designated by Christ himself you know the Bible talks a lot about what the woman can do at home and uh, he even visited Christ himself even visited the home of Mary and Martha who were cooking and fussing about and um, trying to make him comfortable and there are many, many aspects of Titus 2. And a lot of people will focus only on one thing of Titus 2. They'll just focus on the homemaking, or they just focus on the marriage, or they'll focus on the child rearing. But it's a whole bunch of things combined that interact together. And so I, I will mention some of these things as time goes by. And uh, hopefully I can use some of your suggestions too. And so it's a whole lot. It's a whole lot of things that work together. So I want to move on to the um, to the home and how to manage your list. So first of all, I mentioned that you take and write down everything that you need to do that's really urgent that has to be done, and then you write some things down that you'd like to do. Well, what happens to me sometimes is the list just isn't working out. And because something comes up or because I had to get involved, more involved in one of the things on the list. And so what I do is I revise it. I'll just turn the paper over to another blank so side. I'll start all over and I'll revise it and include some more things that need to be done that maybe that I'll have to scrap the other list. But I do this over and over until at the end of the day, I actually do get quite a bit done and I like making a new list. And I don't keep the old list around because uh, sometimes it just wasn't practical. Sometimes it just wasn't possible to do all that. Or sometimes things took care of themselves 
when I did one thing, another thing took care of itself. It's interesting how that works. And it's up to every woman to figure out how things are going to work out for her in her home. Now, not everybody is going to work the same way. We all have husbands on different schedules and children with different needs and uh, all kinds of different things and aspects of the home that, that we do that other people don't do. So start a new list. If you're getting discouraged, start a new list. Now we used to, back in the olden days, if we got discouraged, we would just, uh, the ladies would just go and um, comb their hair again or, you know, change their clothes or do something that just made, gave them a new feeling of starting the day again if they felt like that they weren't getting anywhere. It was just some, some little trick that we used, especially the going to the bathroom and looking in the mirror and fixing our hair. That was uh, something else. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about the food in the pantry. Now, the, and I also I want to read uh, a book, read to you from a book. Now, I was working around my pantry trying to figure out how to make it more efficient, and I discovered something. Do you remember? the jelly cabinets of the old days. They used to even take them with them in their wagons when they went camping, but they had a shelf only about that wide and it would fit a row of jelly jars, but there could be nothing behind them, nothing in front of them. That is the way I think a pantry should be because the deeper your shelf is, the worse that pantry is going to be because your stuff will get lost in there in the back that you don't know is back there and it might um, become outdated, broken, and uh, it just collects dust. So I think that pantries should all be these narrow shelves, jelly jars, only one layer, nothing behind them. You can see everything. That's what I would like is um, almost a floor to ceiling jelly pantry where you could just put everything in there and when you open the door, you see everything in that one layer. There's nothing behind it. Uh, because then that eliminates a lot of having to pull out everything out of these deep, deep shelves and discover that you have half a bag of flour here and you have something else over here and then something here has broken open or because you can't see it all the time. You can't, uh, you, you don't have to tend to it all the time when it is just this uh, shallow layer. And I hope you know what I'm talking about, but I know that the drawers and cabinets in our kitchens are too deep for us because you get things back there maybe a lid falls down and you lose the lid off the pan you wonder where it is it's dark down in that dark uh, hole deep hole and I would prefer more narrow shelves where I can see things e more easily and um, so that is what I think that the pantry should be and then you can rotate things according to the date and when you new, bring new things in left to right, right to left. But uh, these pantries, like I have a cabinet with about five shelves, but they're very, very wide and very deep. And I don't know what's behind it all the behind everything all the time. And uh, particularly the lower shelf is difficult. And I really think that um, be very, very simple for contractors to build in, just build in these pantries in the um, utility room or back behind the kitchen, somewhere like that. It'd be very simple, very easy to do that. And you could probably do it just with um, some wood and a hammer and nail. But um, some of the most simple things, you know, it's just hard to get anybody to do them or to find anything that's like what you need. And it's so simple. So today I am going to read to you uh, and by the way, if you have anything you need to do, I'd like you to go and do it and not be here watching me. I'm not doing anything. I'm going to read to you. Butler's Guide to the Care, Managing the Table, Care of the Home, Managing the Table, Running the Home, and Other Graces. Now, this is quite an old book, but it was republished. It became very um, popular in the 1980s. It says here, answers to all the things you didn't know that you needed to know, um, etc. So this was 1980. These these kinds of books on running the home, on tea time, on um, 
table setting became very, very popular in the 1980s. There was a great revival of interest in the home. And I'm wondering sometimes if the um, original Victoria magazine kind of spurred that interest on or if they all picked up on what people were actually trying to do somehow because we were going to the uh, markets and buying teacups and maybe uh, we were tracked and they figured out what we wanted. But this was an interesting book. Now it has, this man was a butler in a, in a uh, for royalty in a castle somewhere, but it has things in it that we wouldn't do, like how to take care of um, things that we don't use anymore, like real silverware. And it was considered back in the olden days that silverware was extremely important that you eat off of silver cutlery because the silver was supposed to be the mineral. Silver was supposed to be very good for you and um, help, helped with your immunity. And children, when they were born, were given a little silver spoon to eat off of. And I think I had one, and um, some of my grandchildren had them, but it was really important to feed your baby off a silver spoon. I thought that was interesting. And you can go into uh, some health reasons for that and uh, what people thought that it, um, how it, people thought that it aided them in their health at home. And I know my in-laws had uh, real silver, silverware that they're, their parents had given them for their wedding and they bragged on that all the time and they they swore by it so i'm coming to the chapter here called running the home the three most important qualities for running a home are now now he was a butler so you're not a butler so uh you might not have to adhere to this as strictly but it's interesting isn't it and, and probably very helpful. The three most important qualities for running a home are punctuality, organization, and cleanliness. I really um, agree with that. Punctuality is my biggest problem. Uh, I think a lot about things. I make lists about them, but I'm not always punctual. <laughs> if you master these three things, everything else should fall into place. You know, that would be a good thing to teach children, too. Punctuality, organization, and cleanliness. Because if you have that now, somewhere along the line in our education, whether it was college or something, people began to look down on things like organization and cleanliness. And the student was only supposed to think about intellectual things and not take care of his appearance, not worry about neatness and tidiness. And that's very bad because it... Uh, your mind feels more organized, your thoughts are more organized, and your living is more organized. When, you're, or, when you are organized and clean and punctual, and uh, it really does increase your success. If you master these, everything else should fall into place. For me, the first step in running a house is to get up early and leisurely in the morning. Now that's interesting. Uh, Sometimes we get up early and we think that we've got to fill in all that time. We're up so early, we've got all that time. Now we're ahead of the schedule and we can get so much done. But he says early and leisurely in the morning, as I believe in letting the day come to me rather than rushing about with the day. So if you get up really early and you're sitting there watching the sunrise and you have a cup of tea, that day is coming to you. You're not chasing the day. You're not trying to play catch up. I think that's a wonderful advice. He said, get up early and leisurely. You know, nobody likes to jump out of bed and rush mindlessly to the bathroom and brush their teeth and get their clothes on before their thoughts have had time to catch up with what they're doing. And that's one of the um, objections I have to sending children to a public school is that they're getting up at an unearthly hour. It's almost like child labor. And they're sleepy-eyed, and they're running to the bathroom, and then they've got to uh, get it, find everything, or, you know, and, and they can hardly think. You know, they, they really, um, it can really be very bad for them, very disorienting. And uh, so when we started homeschooling, one of the first things we did was to wake up leisurely. We woke up early whenever our body clocks woke us up, which was usually pretty early when the birds started waking up. And, uh, but we're, we're leisure. You know, nobody was saying, hurry up and do this or that. There were no demands. 
on their time at that time and they had plenty of time to rest and to think and that way their education uh, caught up to them really well and they uh, they were better learners because of that so he said uh, he believes in letting the day come to me rather than rushing about with the day my way I my way I start out with a contented mind I understand what that is I'd like you to figure that out too is start out with a contented mind rather than one that is in a state of confusion and unable to plan ahead that is so interesting so he's this is a chapter that discusses plans and schedules inventories cleaning and polishing and how to clean silver now plans and schedules of course he's dealing with the fact that he's a butler and a servant and he had to consult with the uh, orders that were given to him and had to uh, check with everybody else before he did anything so I won't be reading any of that but there were some very valuable things in here and so washing now this is the way we used to wash and I think they still do it uh, in many places where there are where they're butlers and servants but uh, of course I just love the dishwasher because it is is the, the water so nice and hot and it gets everything we have a rinse in ours and after it's used the dishwasher detergent it will rinse all the detergent off so your dishes don't smell or taste like detergent I think that's really important to have a rinse and when we were growing up on the homestead in Alaska my mother boiled the water on top of the the wood cook stove and poured it in a dish pan and with soap and the rinse water was extremely hot because that was considered to you know sanitize everything and then it would air dry in the dish rack this was very important and they were very good at this you know your dishes were squeaky clean when you washed them that way well that's what I like about the dishwasher everything is just so squeaky clean now every now and then you have to clean your dishwasher and you know when things start spitting out um, maybe things that you didn't rinse off and um, you get little coffee grains stuck on things and you know it's time to clean your dishwasher but for the most part I really really like the dishwasher now equipment for washing up you need one or two dish pans I just go and buy the plastic ones at the Dollar Tree and there's one for rinse and one for washing because not everything of course will go in the dishwasher um, there are some things that just aren't dishwasher safe so you need one or two dish pans, detergent, a soft bristle brush or a nail brush, a fine cotton dishcloth, disposable dishcloths such as handy wipes, and soft lint-free cloths or Irish linen tea towels. We have always got two, if not three, in use because when one becomes wet, it must be changed for the dry one. That's so important because you know these new terry cloth dish towels. See, I remember one that was the um, muslin, just the plain cloth. It was still very absorbent, but um, it wouldn't leave any lint or any kind of cotton residue, or anything like that, on your glassware, whereas the the other types of dish towels do. You also need. Steel, steel wool pads for scouring heavy duty pots and pans, and nylon pads for non stick kitchenware. People with sensitive hands should protect them by wearing rubber gloves. I just plunge my hands in water, but then I'm always careful to use hand cream afterwards. You should also have a draining rack and perhaps paper towels for mopping up. I wouldn't use them for drying. Now, we call them dish drainers here, and I have people are so unfamiliar with that now that they'll open up the, my bottom cabinet uh, to get something maybe it's a friend or a guest that um, will see something see the dish drainer and say what's that because they're just not familiar with it and but I would suggest you get one uh, you can now you can get beautiful dish drainers to match your kitchen get them in pink and green blue and um, so I prefer to wash up in a dish pan because most sink stoppers are not watertight and dish pans hold water better. That's true. That's what I use. And sometime I will 
to get some pictures and take it to my kitchen, maybe even do a broadcast in my kitchen of Housewife Radio, because the sink itself is not as sanitary. You know, you can really never get that as clean as you can these little dish pans, and you can um, you can just dump your water out and fill them again, and the, they're also not so hard that your dishes will break in them. Whereas the sink itself might not be safe for you to land your dishes straight in and let them, you know, touch the surface. And so I've always used these little plastic pans, one for the wash and one for the rinse. They protect my dishes so much better if I'm watch washing teacups particularly. So if you are washing in a dish pan, any water that slops over the side can run down the drain. Whereas if you're washing up in a sink full of water and it splashes over, you and the kitchen floor are both going to get wet. That's that's true, and that's one of the main reasons. And also, if that water becomes kind of murky or lukewarm, you can just dump it out and fill up your little pan again. And uh, it's a lot more trouble to do it if you put your dishes directly in the sink. I never do that. So, And finally, it's quicker to empty water out of a dish pan than to drain the sink. Well, see, he heard what I said. <laughs> Plastic dish pans are better than enameled metal ones because they don't scratch. In the old days, see, there's another, somebody else that says in the old days. We used the small wooden ones that were made for us by a cooper. Until after the war, our detergent was a soft soap that we whipped into a lather with whisks like those used for cream, but three times as long. Nowadays, a mild detergent does an excellent job. To make detergent lather faster, sprinkle powder or squirt liquid into your sink before adding water. If your water is hard, add a drop of ammonia, enough to cover the bottom of the bottle cap for a softening effect. I wouldn't have that nasty stuff in my kitchen, especially around children. That's not necessary. Ammonia? Mm -mm. I remember smelling that so much in the old days. I used to wash the floors with it. But it was just awful. It asphyxiates little children. <laughs> I don't trust it. Um, until after the war. Um, a nail brush is good for scrubbing a breadboard or forks. The You know, the forks have the, the tongs, and you've got to get in between them. And I think even if you're using the dishwasher, you should take your... Uh, you know, we have these brushes with long handles. They come in a bundle of three or four at Walmart. And I would give the forks a, a, a scrub before I stuck them in the dishwasher because you want to make sure that all that is cleaned in between those tongs. Um, the bristles of a brush uh, wrinkle out any food particles that have been allowed to dry between the tines. As a rule, if you wash forks straight away, this won't happen. The bristles should be soft, but stiff enough to pass between the tines. Our brushes, which were slightly larger than nail brushes, had soft, natural bristle bristles that did not scratch the silver. Well, most of us uh, use stainless steel. Okay, washing. Here's, are, you, are you bored yet? I hope you're getting something done. <laughs> some people are fussy, and some people are not. But in my opinion, washing up well means inspecting each individual piece and seeing that it is perfectly clean. Even when I'm unloading the dishwasher, I like to pick up a glass and look at it in the light to make sure that it actually did get clean, because sometimes it doesn't. And before I load the dishwasher, I always give everything a bit of a scrub, in, because the dishwasher can't scrub anything. So I like to loosen everything, and uh, the main reason I use a dishwasher is just so, it's such a sanitary hot water um, bath that it goes through. And uh, But it's fairly clean when it gets in there, but not as good. So I really like uh, the dishwasher. It, has, it, it is the duty of whoever is drying to return anything that has not been properly washed. Oh, do you remember that? You know, your brother or your sister, it was their turn to do the drying. And you would do the washing and you'd rinse it and put it in the drainer. Then they would pick it up to dry it and they'd look at it and then, you know, try to find some little reason to send it back. And so you'd be standing there forever re-washing everything because they weren't happy with how it was done and it's so frustrating. <laughs> um, so I always volunteered to dry because uh, it was just so much faster 
than putting up with uh, the inspector. You know, the even a younger brother and sister, they would become quite the inspector, you know, and they felt like they had some kind of authority over you when they became the dryer because they could inspect it and uh, send it back. That was really... So when my children were growing up, I didn't do that with them. They didn't share the job. They It was either their turn to wash the dishes or their turn to sweep the floor or their turn to set the table. But they did the whole individual job themselves and not in a group because I wanted them to see it from start to finish themselves. I wanted them to be able to do things with, outside of a group and also without all that silliness and fussing that went on, you know, <laughs> I was growing up. So everybody does things the way they want to. We are affected by our childhood and how it affected the way we viewed work, whether it was negative or positive. And we tried to, we have a right, you know, when we grow up and have our children to do it our way. So that was what I did. Um, Wash glasses, which is the least. This is how we did it at home. I'll say it before I even start reading it because I believe he probably is going to say what I'm going to say. My mother had us line up the glassware because it was the least dirty, and uh, put and uh, it you know touched your lips and everything, and it had to have the first water. So we washed those and rinsed them and put them in the drainer, and they often uh, air dried quite quickly, and then the next. The next one that wasn't as dirty would go next, and the, and the pots and pans would go last. And in that same water, I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> Nowadays, we uh, are so blessed because we have the, t the running water, hot and cold on tap, and we can change our water and just have just as fresh a water we want when we're washing dishes for any group of dishes. So it says wash the glasses first, and we used to have to take them off the table and line them up and stack them according to how, when we would do them, first, second, third, and fourth, and that was always lined up on the right-hand side of your dishwasher, dishwasher pan. So the least greasy items are the glasses. You wash them first, then spoons, then forks, then knives. Yes, I remember that. The spoons were first. The knives, plates, and serving dishes. If your pots and pans are not already out of the way, clean them last. And he's, he's thinking, of course, that we're using the same water. We don't really have to do that anymore. We can dump our pan out anytime and put fresh water for anything. Um, finish washing up one set of items before going on to the next. As things are easier to rinse while they're still wet and easier to dry while they're still warm. That's interesting, isn't it? Yes. Hmm. I wash, rinse, and dry my glasses before going on to my silver, and my cutlery is ready for storing before I start on my plates and serving dishes. Well, what we used to do is you get the glasses washed, put them in that hot rinse water, and take them out, put them in the dish drainer, and then when your dish water is empty and there's nothing in there, you start putting in your silverware, and you let that sit in there while you dry your glasses. And you always have something in that pan. Because you rinsed the food from the items before you began washing them, that was really important. We often had a little pan of water that came before the dishwater that uh, was lukewarm or even cold, and you would rinse uh, your dishes in that first. So no food particles would enter the washing area. And that could be why we were able to wash so many dishes in our pots and pans in that still. It was still fairly clean. Your washing up water should be nearly clear at the finish as it was at the start. Yeah, rinse them first and then your washing up water will be nearly clear at the finish as it was at the start. You can wash all your glasses in the same dish pan of water, change your water and wash all your cutlery, change your water again and wash all your plates. I wash glasses and knives in tepid water, and the rest of my washing up is done in hot water, as hot as my hands can stand it. Now, he mentioned rubber gloves, and I know a lot of you use rubber gloves, and for years I used rubber gloves, but I developed a terrible skin condition, and I thought maybe it was the detergent, or maybe I was touching something um, that was causing my skin on my fingers to peel really badly, and I 
tried everything and every lotion in the book that you could find. And when I quit using rubber gloves, my skin condition went away. And I just thought that was interesting. Uh, the inside has usually got some kind of flocking on them or something. Maybe that was affecting me. So I don't use rubber gloves unless the water is really unbearably hot and I'm doing a, scrubbing a pot or pan. But I don't use them. I don't wear them all the time anymore. And the other thing I wanted to say about that was that the, I know a lot of ladies take off their wedding rings when they wash dishes. But what I discovered was uh, my wedding rings never need a cleaning because apparently dishwashing liquid is the best thing for uh, jewelry. <laughs> yes, if you ever set some jewelry in some dishwashing liquid, it cleans it really well and it just comes out new. And my wedding rings look as good as new because I wash the dishes uh, with a detergent in there and I use a really nice detergent called Dawn and it uh, it my my rings just look beautiful they just look new I don't take them off to wash the dishes because that uh, that really keeps these sparkling clean and that keeps me from losing them <laughs> okay the pantry staff now he's talking about working in this with for royalty here which we don't so not everything in this book was applicable but I enjoyed reading the different things you do the pantry staff were responsible for seeing that plates arrived at the table clean because we were the ones who actually put them in front of the Lord and Lady when the kitchen people washed plates they might be a little careless but when the pantry people washed them they shone I used to watch the plates like mad if I ever came across a dirty plate I whisked it away at once and changed it and I always checked them thoroughly before a party to make sure we wouldn't arrive in the dining room and at seven instead of with seven instead of eight now I do want to mention that the dishwasher is absolutely wonderful but once in a while if you have overcrowded the dishes to get them in there they won't always uh, clean as effectively so I wanted you to know that and that uh, you need to examine the dishes from the dishwasher when you take them out because sometimes you might forget to put the little sign that says clean or dirty on it and think that they're clean and start maybe you're just uh, collecting a batch to get ready to wash and you've spent the day loading it up and you might maybe forget to run it and the next day you think those are all clean so you really need to examine I've made I've caught myself and get out one glass, start to put it away and look at it and say, huh, that doesn't look right. And then I'll look at the rest of it and it's not, I haven't washed it yet. And one way that I can tell that I have not washed the dishwasher dishes, I put the little um, detergent pellet in and close the little lid on that. If that is flipped up when I open the dishwasher, then the dishes have been washed because it'll automatically flip up during one of the cycles. But if it's still closed, Either it's malfunctioned or I have I forgot to turn the dishwasher on. It's still in there. Okay, so for those of you who uh, haven't grown up with dishwashers, whoops, I lost my marker, fell out, so I don't know what I was going to read here. Um, I'll just find a couple of things that I think you might find interesting. And then we're going to go on and talk about a few other things. Um, so the final rinsing. If washing dishes isn't thoroughly, uh, if washing dish, dishes, if they're not thoroughly rinsed, they will be smeary and dull. Everything but glass and bone handled knives should be rinsed in very hot water, which evaporates quickly so the items dry much faster. The way Barbara and I rinse is to pour three quarters of a jug of water over each set of items. So none of our washing up is left sitting in rinsing water surrounded by its own suds. That's interesting too. Yes, running water is much better to rinse in, although a lot of us can't afford to just keep the tap of hot water on, you know, so that's why we rinse it in the pan of water. Uh, but it's never good to let those dishes just sit in that pan. You, you quickly rinse them and put them in the uh, the uh, dryer rack we called it the dish drainer um, so instead of pouring a jug of water over all your items you can fill a dish pan with clear water and briefly immerse each one 
Either pour warm water over glasses, letting it spill over the rim of each glass, or immerse each one in the water and then stand it upright on the draining board. Now, we don't do that. We turn it upside down on the draining board because water comes out of it. <laughs> I, I can, I'll never forget uh, having visitors and they wanted to help with the dishes years ago when I was growing up and they would just take it out of the uh, rinse pan and just set it in the drainer but not upside down. They have to, you know, your pots and pans and your glassware and your bowls, they have to be turned upside down so they'll all drain. So anything that has been washed in hot water and rinsed, rinsed and stacked will be left will be already half dry. Finish drying with a smooth Irish linen tea towel or a lint-free cloth. We use muslin here. Either one should be soft as a rough cloth. Either one should be soft as a rough cloth may leave scratches. You should hold the towel or cloth in both hands when handling the items to avoid leaving finger marks. Now this is interesting because it's one thing that we learned when my children were growing up is you grab a hold of a glass and uh, you wrap a towel around it and then wipe around on the inside with the, with the end of the towel. And uh, you also have to be very careful that you don't stick uh, your hand in a towel inside of a goblet and break the whole thing. Uh, you've got to be very careful about that. So I could, I, should, I could go on and read to you more about polishing plates, but uh, I want to talk about some other things. And particularly we got into We've gotten into some discussions about some of these things, and and so I want to go on and talk about that. And there was a question about people that uh, how to handle people, and also you know your children are going to be around people too, and they'll pick up some awful habits if if you don't after people leave your, or you re, you leave people and they've had bad habits, bad conversational habits. You need to sit your children down and say, now, this is the way they do it. But we have a different set of values, and I don't want you children to talk about yourself all the time. And I don't want you children to, you know, talk about this or to um, object to something everyone says or argue about everything. Now, that's how they do it. That's their set of values. And that way you're not running somebody down, but you are allowed to correct the situation, and you are allowed to teach your children. And... Um, so you can say, okay, now you notice that Mrs. So-and-so just talked about herself all the time. That's how she does it, and her family doesn't seem to mind, but we don't want you to do that. And uh, so just remember, that's her set of values. We have a different set of values. That's always a good way to handle it. And one thing you can do about the person that has just the, um, we, we always have these people, I think, ever since... I've known there have always been the ones that like to object to everything, that like to argue with everything. It's just the way they grow up, and they that's how they converse, and they they probably don't know that it isn't, um, it isn't very nice for everybody to do that. They think they're just being friendly maybe, but the thing that you have to be careful with, and I was taught this when I was really, really young, by an older woman who said, now we're going to uh, be getting together with a lot of ladies and there's one lady there that just talks about herself all the time. And she said, so you have to please in front of the rest of us, she said, if you're alone with her, it's different. But you know, in order to keep her from spoiling the, the whole conversation of everyone else, do not ask her, how are you? You have to be really careful the questions you ask people because if you ask them how they are and they are known to be complainers, then you, you've just opened up the door for them to start in and um, take over the conversation and to uh, bore everybody to tears. So you don't want to enable them. Now, one thing that, that you can do is to, um, uh, to, to avoid it is to talk positive to them and tell them they look well and tell them um, that they've uh, compliment them on something that they've done that's, that's very, very positive. And it gives them food for thought, too. You can see them thinking when you do that, and you kind of turn the conversation to that, to that um, um, area where they can, uh, for the first time, some of them, you know, can think about something positive.
Now I want to also talk about holding up the stagecoach. <laughs> that was the only thing I could think of as an illustration for uh, some of the bad conversation habits of people. They like to hold up the stagecoach. If you remember the old westerns, the older days, uh, that we used to watch on television, um, there was always a bandit that held up the stagecoach. And the stagecoach was uh, forced to stop. Everybody got out, handed over their gold, and uh, ended up with nothing, and the bandits got away. And so what you have to do is uh, envision these people that uh, spoil the conversation by constantly, by constantly contradicting everything and making it seem, making life seem worse. You know, uh, that uh, you make sure they don't hold up the stagecoach. In other words, they don't rob everybody of their enthusiasm for life and for the moment and uh, just the enjoyment of one another and sharing. Uh, sharing things and kind of good conversation that they don't grab all the gold and run off and leave everybody sitting there feeling empty because they spoiled the conversation. And I clearly remember an embarrassing moment when we were in a group together and uh, I guess a couple of families had gotten together. It was a long time ago and I uh, probably don't remember every single detail, but uh, you know how people will sit maybe in uh, side by side and start a little quiet conversation and then over here maybe somebody else will be talking. Well, one person decided they wanted everyone's attention. So they said, um, you're spoiling my evening. The person said, you're spoiling my evening because you're not listening to me and I, I want to say something and I don't like don't like it that everybody's you know talking and, and we were all just enjoying ourselves but some people just like to come in and make rules and then discipline everybody and it's to me it reminded me of holding up the stage we used to call it the stage you know the stage is due at such and such a time and uh, and here were these uh, people coming in on the stagecoach and had lost all their valuables to the um, to the bandits and <laughs> So what happens is these people come into your midst and they they seem to put a downer on everything and you just you just leave with a feeling of defeat. And so I'd like to talk a little bit of how to out outwit this. And that is you have to outlast them. You have to outrun them. You have to outwit them and you have to outwork them. You just have to outmanage them because they usually only know one thing to do, and that is to contradict everybody, to dominate everybody, to talk about themselves, to be the big know-it-all. And what you have to do is uh, calmly outwit them, outrun them, and outlast them. And uh, it just takes a little bit of practice, and there are techniques for doing it. And so... Um, you can you can just take a, a cue from business now business it um, business continues it doesn't stop because uh, the season has ended or because they um, they had a sale or something that doesn't stop it just keeps moving forward and I think with any conversation what you have to do is just keep moving forward now most of us are so intimidated by these types of people that like to dominate, that like to know it all, and that like to contradict everything that we just clamp up. And uh, I think it would be a lot of fun sometime to practice, uh, to have, a, uh, like one of the books that I read to you talk about conversations, said to have a collection in your mind of things that you may talk about or ask about that will divert some of these types of people if you have a problem with them. And like I say, take your children aside after any of these incidents where they have observed someone yelling, someone dominating, someone being very rude, and say, we can't do that. That's how they do it. That's their set of values. And I explained to you what a set of values was last time, or a couple of videos ago. Um, I didn't label all my videos in the beginning, but uh, the last year I have tried to do that. And I believe the word set of values would have been in that one. And so while you have your own set of values and what you believe that you can do and cannot do, the, 
the other people don't. So they have a different set of values. And so this is where you need to teach your children. You know, so-and-so was contradicting the whole time or so-and-so was just negative at everything. We can't be that way. That's not nice. We're supposed to build one another up. We, You know, if we're Christians and we're in a Christian home, we want to build one another up, not be... Uh, one of the uh, things that is most unproductive is to be blaming and criticizing and punishing people. Uh, that just doesn't do anything. It isn't productive at all. But a person who really loves people and who really loves life is not going to do that. They're going to find out how something got broken, how you can fix it, and how you can do better, and how you can move on, and how you can help people be more productive in their lives. So um, I want to move on now to safety with uh, children because every now and then I think of something about about the children and I don't think that you can always get these but one thing that's really dangerous I like uh, the book Health Safety and Manners by A. Becca because they were they had several grades of that and I think that those three things, if you can manage this, like this man said in this book, if you could manage those three things, which I believe was punctuality and uh, I don't know what the other two. I'd have to rewind my speech so I could figure out what that was. That uh, if you could manage those three things, which um, I call you know health, safety, and manners, uh, if you could manage those three things and teach your children that, then uh, you're, you're well on your way. To, to learning other things and uh, one of the things I think you should avoid as far as safety goes is and I don't know if you can still buy these anymore wire coat hangers I'm so suspicious of those I've seen those hurt children hurt animals just you can get hurt on them yourself nobody buys wire coat hangers anymore in fact I don't even think in the antique stores or the thrift stores they even use wire coat hangers they use a nice stainless steel one that is thick or they use the hollow um, plastic ones and they also are better for hanging your clothes on so I wanted you to know about that so here are those three things from this book um, punctuality organization and cleanliness <laughs> but for children health safety and manners those three things uh, will be very beneficial to them keep them safe and um, when they have learned those three things, health, safety, and manners, they'll become better learners in other things, too. And so I, I just think that those are so important. And uh, then we talked a little bit last time about, I say we, you know. Um, oh, and I have been considering doing the live stream, although, you know, you do have to, it would have to be for people who maybe are, alone and there's a holiday and uh, they end up being alone and probably and needs and, and would find that valuable and aren't housekeeping at the time because you can't housekeep while you're doing a live stream you've got to um, start typing in your response and then I've got to read it and so I'm not sure I'm considering it I'm watching how other people do live stream and I'm considering it, of doing one it might be kind of fun to interact like that so so now we've covered several things today. We've covered the pantry, we've covered uh, washing dishes, and we've covered in preparation and I, in your appearance. And uh, so I think that that's really important. The appearance, that's your beginning. That's your start. That's what you start out with. And uh, it's like putting on, um, it's like putting the keys in the ignition of the car, isn't it? When you, when you get dressed and you fix your hair and you get ready. Also, I think it's really important to spend some time in front of the mirror because you get to look at yourself to see if you're getting discouraged, you can kind of look at your eyes. If you're getting hardened, if uh, you've become bitter, if you've become weary of your work, then you need to, the mirror is going to help prompt you to think that you need to have a new perspective and there has to be different ways to do things. Now, I don't always follow the same routine because I like to keep my mind fresh. I also like to keep my house fresh. I'll change things around. I'll change the, um, the cushions around and I'll put some things in a bedroom and bring some things out of a bedroom, change the lamps around and do things like that because I'm going to be in the house 
facing the four walls most of the time when I'm not, you know, out getting groceries. And uh, so I think it's really important to give it a, a fresh look, especially if uh, you live out in the country. And uh, and this is, uh, it, it just gives you a new, just, just gives you a new house to, to be in when you do that. I think that's so important. Well, ladies, I've talked long enough, and I hope you're having a wonderful uh, Christmas Eve and uh, that uh, you have a very peaceful day. And I'll talk to you next time. And please leave a comment. And I hope you have a, a lovely, lovely day and the rest of the year. I'm hoping to do a few more of these before the new year. So maybe I'll see you again. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.